Uh, it's, uh, I've, heard, uh, I've heard Bob Zubin talk before, and Bob's a hard person to follow in anything, and I think most of you have heard him earlier this morning. Uh, and his, uh, he's infectious in terms of his enthusiasm uh, and his interest in space. And um, he wants to explore space and see it explored. I want to make money from space. Uh, that's a little bit different concept, but not necessarily, uh, 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 not necessarily a problem. And we want to focus on the attributes of space, first of all. What are they? And how can we use those attributes uh, in the long term to really do something commercial in that environment? <coughs> the, um, specifically, we know it's a vantage point. There are satellites flying, and we use those satellites to, to, uh, to uh, view the Earth in various ways and for various purposes. And that's been around for 20 or 25 years now. So that, in fact, is becoming a commercial sector uh, in space. Uh, there is a microgravity environment there, and there have been experiments in Skylab uh, trying to do things in microgravity, uh, both in materials and life sciences and biotechnology, and that's an ongoing process, and there are some inklings of, uh, of some possible commercial aspects uh, in that environment. There are resources present, and Bob Zubrin mentioned one of those resources it happens to be uh, carbon dioxide on the surface of Mars. Uh, there are asteroids out there, there are uh, helium-3 on the moon, there is a variety of resources that could be used uh, from the space environment, and not much of that has been realized yet today. And finally, there's a vacuum present in space. We all know there's a vacuum present in space. Uh, we've seen that from the very beginning, astronauts wore space suits, <coughs> uh, and that the, the space suits are really there, not necessarily to protect them from the radiation environment, because that's secondary. Uh, that'll kill you after a year or two, a vacuum will kill you after a minute or two. And our focus then was, why don't we look at this vacuum of space? What is it? It's the absence of matter. If there's nothing there, then whatever you do uh, in that vacuum environment is not going to be contaminated. And so uh, let's use this attribute of space that hasn't been really utilized in the past, uh, use that attribute of space as, a, as an advanced vacuum chamber, and use that vacuum chamber to make new materials and devices. In terms of materials and devices, what are we focusing on? We're going to focus on high purity, high quality, thin film materials grown in vacuum. Turns out that people have worked in vacuum technologies on the Earth now for 30 or 40 years, making thin film materials in vacuum. You can grow a thin film material one atom at a time if you want, one atomic layer at a time, and if you do that in an ideal environment, that, that thin film material is going to be uncontaminated. So we'll focus on something called molecular beam epitaxy, epitaxial growth. I'll give you a primer on that, a 30 second primer in a minute or two. But you can look at a large number of different materials. Uh, and we'll focus initially on, on semiconductors uh, and some oxides. You can do processing in that unique vacuum environment. You can do purification in that vacuum environment. So there are a number of aspects of vacuum in space that can be used uh, and can be used in areas that have some commercial importance. Well, why are thin films of interest to us? So let me focus on semiconductors and thin films. It turns out that 99% of all semiconductors that we use today are silicon. Silicon is a great material. You can make it in your garage. That's why it was one of the, actually, the second, uh, the second uh, transistor that was focused on significantly. Uh, germanium really uh, was used initially as a transistor. However, uh, the reason silicon is so good uh, or so widely used is because you can, one can make it with very few number of defects. Only reason, really the only reason that it's, it's, it has its wide use that it has right now. There are, however, 14 factorial, you can calculate that number, you can calculate it if you wish, other compound semiconductor materials that have, <coughs> uh, many of which have predicted performances higher than silicon. Now, of those 14 factorial, only a dozen or two dozen maybe have been looked at in any great detail. Nonetheless, even those have either higher electric mobilities, i.e. faster devices, use less power, we're better in the microwave regime, uh, uh, are, are photonically active, i.e. they're sensitive to light or emit light. Um, and yet, we have not significantly used those other materials, those advanced materials, for making new devices in the semiconductor arena. Now, that's changed most recently, but there's still a lot to do. One of the problems for not using these unique materials and the high performance materials is because they have too many atomic scale defects in them. They are not like silicon. You simply can't throw a single crystal and pool in your garage and have 10 to the 8th defects per cubic centimeter. You have 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 15th defects per 
percent, millions of times larger number of defects, and you've got to reduce those defects to make these materials usable and therefore realize their full performance. And we do that through something called epitaxial growth. Epitaxial growth is a technique of making thin films that was developed in the late 70s, early 80s at Bell Telephone Laboratories by Al Cho and John Arthur. And uh, it really is a growing of a thin film material one atom at a time, one atomic layer at a time. And if we look at the, the little schematic on the side, there are two sources of atoms that are being, say, it's in some way evaporated or, or deposited on the surface. And they are lighting on a surface that has an atomic template there already and they form a thin film, atomically ordered thin film. And if this is done in a vacuum environment where there are no impurity atoms present, no other atoms present, in fact, then the thin film that you form is, in fact, ultra-high purity thin film, anatomically structured. This is a materials design at the atomic level. I can grow a material that has five layers of, of, of element A, 10 layers of element B, followed by six layers of element C. I can stack these layers almost any way I wish and therefore develop materials that have properties really unknown in the, in the natural world. Now, that's only a thin film. And you may say, well, why are thin films going to be a, of any real use? If you look at a microelectronics device, here's a schematic of one, it turns out that the device itself is made only in the top, say, 10, 50,000 atomic layers of the material itself. And so it's only the top surface of the material that you start with, the silicon, the silicon wafer is an example, within which the device is made. And as a result, um, if you make a thin film on top of a poor substrate of very high quality, it, that is where the device is made in the material in the first place. What are applications of these devices, of these advanced materials? There's a very, there's a, a uh, shortened list here, this list can, can take up several view graphs worth. And you, we've seen some of this already come, in, come into play. Flat screen TVs you see in Times Square, they've got a, uh, they've got a, large, uh, a large flat screen TV that's based on, on LED technology that's made from these advanced materials. So uh, there are applications for these, therefore there is a commercial driver to see these improved materials brought to the marketplace. Well, since the technique has been around since the late 70s, why haven't we seen many more of these uh, advanced materials applied in our, in our current technologies? I classify that as some terrestrial limitations to this epitaxial growth technology. The materials that are made, the best ones that are made, are still not good enough. And that's because we have limited vacuum terrestrially. We have limited pumping speed, the ability to remove contaminants from that vacuum environment. And we have limited source purity. The starting materials have to be pure to begin with, so you don't contaminate the environment by the, the source materials. We also have the lack of ability to grow a mixture of materials. The alchemistic approach that has been so productive in material science over the past 200 years, add A to the pot, mix it, add B to the pot, mix it, add C to the pot, mix it, simply doesn't work here. It turns out that the vacuum chamber you use to make these thin films has walls, and those walls are contaminated by the material you just made the hour before or the minutes before, and that, that comes off the walls to contaminate the future materials that you make. And so you've got the problem here of, of not having that, that uh, wonderful uh, serendipitous effect of making new materials and therefore new performance standards. And you also have very limited vacuum volumes. The best vacuum chambers on Earth, the highest quality vacuum chambers, have the size of the order of this u graph projector in the stand a half a cubic meter in size. You can't do much in that value if I talk about production materials and commercialization. So our focus back in 1989 was go to space. We know there's a vacuum in space, why don't we use that vacuum in space? Well, there are a couple of problems, the, the most significant of which is the fact that the vacuum in space really isn't very good where the shuttle flies, which is the the region of space that's really most accessible to us currently, low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit here at the order of a few hundred kilometers uh, gives you a vacuum environment of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 tor. One tor is one millimeter of mercury, 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere. We can do 10 to the minus 10 tor in our vacuum chamber, so why should I go to space? Well, it turns out that uh, to, to improve the quality of thin film materials, we have to improve our vacuum levels by factors of 10 or 100 or 1,000 at least. So let's pick a number of 10 to the minus 14 torr. That means I've got to go to something like 20 or 30 
thousand kilometers to get to that vacuum level in space. That's not as doable, it's not readily doable, uh, and so uh, we need some other idea to improve the vacuum environment in space if we wanted to use that vacuum environment for thin film materials development. Well, it turns out also in the late 70s, early 80s at NASA Langley Research Center, there was a concept proposed by <coughs> Melfi and Outlaw that's called the wake concept in space. And that concept is the following. It's very akin to a motor boat in water, but that's hydrodynamics. This is, this is particle flow. Nonetheless, the, the point is with a vehicle flying in space, it flies faster than the velocity of the residual gas atoms that are there and essentially outruns those gas atoms. They can't fill in behind the vehicle it can't diffuse in behind the vehicle. And as a result, behind every vehicle that flies in space, you form a vacuum wake. The predictions for the vacuum wake, the calculations that were done in the uh, late 70s, and we've redone them uh, over the past the five or six years, is that that vacuum wake should be this 10 to the minus, minus 14 core number that I identified for you just a minute or so ago. And I said every vehicle in space forms this, this sorry, in low Earth orbit space, forms a wake. The problem is that every vehicle that has flown to date is so contaminating that, that it contaminated, or so contaminated that it, it contaminates its own wake. The shuttle is infinitely dirty as far as I'm concerned, and as a result, the wake that it would form is simply contaminated by its effluents. Now the advantages then of this wake concept are, are, are manifold. Number one, it's a very hard vacuum. It's an ultra vacuum. It's a vacuum that's thousands of times better than the best vacuums that are available terrestrially. You've got a near infinite pumping speed. Half of space is a pump for you. It's a vacuum pump. All a vacuum pump does is remove atoms from your environment. Anything coming uh, off your, your vehicle in the wake environment never comes back uh, to haunt you because it doesn't collide with anything. So it's a lot of turn around. Very large vacuum volume, that disc that I showed you, if I made that disc four meters in diameter, I'd have 50 cubic meters of vacuum volume, the size, actually larger than the size of this room. At 10 to the minus 14 torr with semi-infinite pumping speed. There's also a nice trick uh, that there's atomic oxygen on demand, and you'll see what that's important downstream. It turns out that 95% of the atmosphere at lower orbit is atomic oxygen. So it's a unique environment. Uh, if you can access that environment, access that environment to generate this ultra vacuum concept, this wake concept. And our focus was, in fact, to generate wake vacuum, to utilize that vacuum for thin film growth and other experiments, characterize the verified gas flows that predicted or proposed that wave vacuum environment. However, you need a vehicle to do that. And I said all vehicles that have flown today make waves because they don't make vacuum waves. So we developed and designed, starting in March the 15th of 1989, this vehicle called the Wake Shield Facility. And the focus of the Wake Shield Facility <coughs> is uh, to demonstrate the fabrication in space vacuum of critical building blocks for advanced semiconductor development and production. We want a free-flying platform for growing thin films in space. From that quick picture, and I'll show you a bit more in a second. The platform is a disc-shaped vehicle. Why is it a disc? Because no one's done this experiment before. We didn't know whether or we could predict the vacuum wakes properly. And I knew if that we designed the disc, we could analytically model that. It's a very simple shape to model. We can therefore model whether we understand the vacuum environment or not. It's equipped with apparatus to grow these thin films, this epitaxial growth apparatus. It's transported in the pellet bay of the shuttle on a, on a carrier, deployed from the bay on the arm, and it's a self-contained free-flying platform, also capable of supporting other experiments. This is uh, Lake Shield being integrated down at Kennedy Space Center for uh, RSTS-80 flight. And you see the disc-shaped vehicle. You see the carrier, which is uh, stays in the payload bay. You also notice it's a relatively shiny, a little bit wavy, and metallic. That vehicle happens to be out of stainless steel. Now, no one in their right mind flies stainless steel. Why? Because it's massive. 
However, stainless steel is the only material we know of in terms of how to, uh, to passivate stainless steel so it doesn't outgas and contaminate a wake environment that it would form. And so we, in fact, made this out of a, shit, a thin sheet of stainless, 60,000 stainless steel with a center chassis that, that uh, uh, does all of the work in the thin film world. <clears throat> what you see here is a number of small tubes. They are furnaces that evaporate gallium, aluminum, arsenic, silicon, beryllium, indium, etc. In the center is a carousel that holds substrate wafers on top of which we grow the thin films. And uh, I'll show you some pictures in a little while of how this thing actually operates. Here is, <coughs> backwards again, here is, uh, you can see a bit about the physical size of the whole system being loaded into the transporter to go out to, out to the pad, and uh, it's of the order of uh, filling, filling up the corner of the payload bay. In terms of the current, in terms of the program, we identified the Wakefield program really as an evolutionary program. No one's ever done this before. And we were trying to do a program that, will, that would allow us to generate uh, some applications-oriented devices and products from a program that has really zero research base. We have to start from scratch. We have to do the proof of concept that, in fact, we can generate ultra-vacuum. We can make uh, high-quality thin films in, in, the, in that environment. And we can make it in such a way that commercial quantities are going to be available for someone in the industry to take over this project. And we did this in the following way. We did a very highly cost-effective platform design. Uh, a little bit in terms of uh, Bob Zubrin's uh, 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 concepts here. We didn't have the hundreds of millions of dollars to put a spacecraft in space. Industry wouldn't do that if industry wants to make money. They want to do certain things very, very cost-effectively. And so we did what we classified as a, a commercial approach to develop the hardware. We did a small team. Space Industry, GP Tech was our principal engineering partner. NASA Johnson was our operations partner, and the University of Houston Space Academic Texas Center was, in fact, the, the, the science and, and, uh, and design lead uh, on this, on this uh, program. We designed the commercial specifications, and that meant we accepted some risk in the program. This is not a flight to Mars or a flight to Pluto or a flight anywhere else that would take uh, months, years to, to arrive and had to work when it got there. This was a four-flight program which would go up the first time. If it didn't work 100%, we'd be able to tune it and fix it up the second time and the third time. And it was more akin to how General Motors makes your automobile. They don't guarantee that your Chevrolet will never break in three years. They warranty it and says if it breaks, bring it back, we'll fix it. If they tried to guarantee that it would never break, your Chevrolet would cost you $50 million. We, in fact, didn't guarantee that, this, that the vehicle will work 100% on the first for the second and third flights because we took this risk. And in doing that risk, we developed a platform for one-seventh of the cost of a traditional aerospace platform. It's a significant cost savings. And yes, we could have gotten another 5 or 10% uh, reliability out of this system, but we'd have to spend another $150 million to do that. And that simply doesn't add up in today's commercial market. Now, you want something that works, but you don't want something that's gonna, that uh, is uh, uh, economically un. Uh, not viable for you to utilize. Well, in the current configuration, the uh, weight shield itself is a uh, free flying platform, and that's because I said that every vehicle that is flown today contaminates its own weight. They are dirty vehicles, and so therefore we have to be, the weight shield has to be away from any dirty vehicle that's out there, otherwise you'll have a weight contaminated. Turns out in the first flight, we stayed on the arm of the shuttle. We were 40 to 20 meters away from the shuttle and found significant contamination of our thin films from the shuttle environment. It's a 12 foot diameter stainless steel disc. We could have made it 14 feet in diameter. It turns out that in making it 14 feet in diameter would have cost us another $250,000 to move the vehicle from Houston to Florida. Making it 12 feet in diameter, diameter allowed, allowed us to put it in the standard United Moving Man and uh, cost us only $10,000 to move there. So that was a, a more of a commercial approach instead of a standard aerospace approach. We made a dedicated cross state carrier. We have a total weight of about 9,000 pounds, and it turns out that a quarter pail a day of the shuttles that we have to take 
in terms of size, and therefore that's the, uh, the weight allocation for the quarter panel today. And so we didn't have, didn't have much concern here in terms of uh, conserving on our weight. In fact, on the first flight, we had to fly ballast for, for NASA, which is uh, uh, even not the CG of the, of the orbit. The system has everything it needs for a free flight platform. It makes the thin films, it measures the vacuum environment, it has power, has communication link, has command control, onboard computer, it's got video. Uh, a compressed video for uh, it has a last system to hold it in the tail of the vein and then release it. Attitude control system, propulsion system, although I don't call it propulsion, it's simply a cold gas thruster. And it's got structural and mechanical and really are compatible with the ultra vacuum requirements that we need to make this thing work. In terms of the wake shield, it requires cleanliness. Our focus is vacuum and being clean. That's why we have a stainless steel vehicle. Uh, we minimize, eliminate volatile production. No off-gassing, we have no rubber O-rings or Viton O-rings or elastomers or Teflon, etc. On the wake side, on the ram side, the leading edge of the vehicle, we accepted uh, uh, some of those materials, but that's on the dirty side, so to speak. This is the cleanest vehicle ever flown. Hubble Space Telescope was was purported to be the cleanest vehicle ever flown. Hubble was worried about dust particles that are one micron in size. We're worried about atoms as contaminants on the surface. We initially, however, realized that since we are in the payload bay of the orbiter, uh, it's not a very clean environment. And uh, I neglected to mention that we have, uh, I'll pass up. We have a center section of the, the vehicle, the working section, really encased in a, in a vacuum chamber, so to speak, on the way up. On a launch. However, the outer portions are exposed to the payload bay, and so we want to make sure those are clean before we start doing any work on orbit. And we, in fact, then use the unique environment of space to clean our vehicle after we launch it. I said there's atomic oxygen present in space, 95% of the atmosphere at low infrared atomic oxygen, approximately. So what we do when we deploy the vehicle, the wake shield from the payload bay on the arm, we first point the wake side, the thin film growth side, into the atomic oxygen stream. That burns off all, the, all hydrocarbons that are present there. Someone may have sneezed when they were in the payload bay. The astronauts touched it with their finger as they were doing the last, uh, the last scrub of the vehicle on the l before the doors close, et cetera, et cetera. This will burn off the hydrocarbons that, uh, that would give carbon as a contaminated species um, uh, for the thin film growths. And after an orbit or two of ramp cleaning, the arm flips the wake shield to the other side. The wake is formed. The arm is moved. And in fact, the uh, the vehicle then takes off as a free flying platform. Here again is a picture of the wake shield on the arm being extracted from the carrier. Here you see the bell section, which protects the center, se the center region of the, of the wake shield from contamination. And uh, it's taken out of the payload bay and then uh, set free. Identified as a four flight program, we have now moved into a, a proposed five flight program. The first one was. Back in February uh, 94 in STS-60, it demonstrated the vacuum wake formation. We did identify wake formation, but also identified contamination of the wake due to the fact that we were on the arm of the orbiter. And uh, we found the water vapor coming off the orbiter contaminating that environment. Wake shield 2 flew in September 95 on, on, on STS-69. And we grew the highest reported purity gallium arsenide films uh, on that flight. Wake shield 3 flew last November, and we grew up textile thin film devices. Four is in work, we want to demonstrate batch processing. In other words, make more than one, two, three, or five samples. Make 100 samples as an example. And then on five, really do a prototype production manufacturing, something like three or 400 samples on orbit for an extended period of time. This is the uh, vehicle at free flight on STS 69. This is the clean side, the wake is formed here, it's flying in that direction. This is the ram side, the dirty side, all our avionics are on this side. In fact, there's a lot of real estate on that side, so we also put other payloads on that, on that side of the wake shield because uh, since we're flying, we have a few extra pounds of, uh, of mass margin, might as well use that for some good uh, additional good purpose. Momentum will stay once. Momentum will stabilize uh, and torque rods. And the pointing is not necessarily critical <coughs> in, uh, in this vehicle. As long as it's pointed more or less in the flight direction, it turns out that we form a wake back here. And whether the, that wake uh, 
uh, conical region is slightly shifted as a function of time is not really relevant. On our, sec on our third flight, we had a plus or minus two degree variance in terms of the, uh, uh, the pointing of the vehicle, which is more than adequate for what we have to do. I mentioned uh, 80. That was in uh, November the 19th of uh, uh, 1996. And uh, there's always been a couple of firsts on, uh, on most of, on all of our windshield flights. This, the first here was that there were two free-flying platforms that were in orbit uh, at the same time with the, with the orbiter. So there's a three-body problem they have to try to solve. And there were a couple of constellations as a result of that. Uh, and that flight, but everything went very successfully there. <laughs> This is uh, the wake shield leaving the arm. Turns out that the arm is retracted from the wake shield. The standard approach that NASA takes to deploying a, sat to deploying a satellite is to uh, retract the arm and then fire the thrusters of the orbiter to move away from the vehicle. Well, we just finished cleaning this after an orbit. If you fire monumental hydrogen thrusters, we get contamination of the, of the vehicle. And so our answer from day one was there will be no thruster firings during the time that we were anywhere near the orbiter. And of course, NASA said, no, you can't do that. We've never done that before. So uh, uh, we have to argue long and hard. But it turns out we have, you can just see a little nib there, a little uh, quarter inch tube, which turns out to be nitrogen gas. We call, they call it a thruster. I just call it a uh, uh, tube. Uh, and we just bleed nitrogen gas out of the end to give us a little bit of delta V to move us uh, out of the uh, environment of the orbiter. And we go back behind the orbiter at about 30 miles uh, as a free flying platform and do all of our our thin film growths, let's see. I have to remember which is which way, but uh, that's better because I know it flies in this direction. <clears throat> and you can see the thruster uh, or the, the tube there very clearly. The, uh, <coughs> the wave shield three wafers here is a half a wafer that we grew, and that's just a reflection of a, of a, a, a typing up there. One of the first signs of a good quality growth is a very specular surface. You grew a thin film that, that is very <coughs> very smooth and smooth at the atomic level, although the specularity uh, at the wavelength of light here doesn't uh, show that. We've seen, however, that um, from far uh, further analysis that in fact we have extremely specular surfaces, therefore uh, high quality thin film growth. We have, uh, and as an example, we've been able to characterize the layers that we grew, and here's an extra diffraction measurement of a 700 angstrom thick layer of aluminum gallium arsenide below a gallium arsenide layer. 700 angstroms of the order of 500 or so layers of gallium arsenide. We didn't characterize its existence, so we are growing, uh, growing the layers we expected to grow there. And uh, we, in fact, have made a, a simple junction, device of being a junction uh, from one of our samples uh, uh, that we grew on orbit. Turns out the layers that we grew in this flight are a bit thinner than we had expected. However, we're getting still some some device uh, function here, and this is then a uh, characterization further of the environment and the applications of this, this environment to make real products downstream. To mention a wave shield four, we are working the manifest for 1999. We want to grow larger quantities of thin film materials. We grew seven wafers on wave shield three. We grew five on wave shield two. Um, we want to do batch runs for industry. Industry wants to have samples in their hand, put in their production line, give me 10 samples, and I will run them from my production line and determine uh, as to the, their use and their quality with respect to the products that we're specifically making. We want to incorporate robotics and automation to allow us to handle these 100 wafers continuously on orbit and more autonomous operation. Now, in terms of that environment, let me kind of reiterate the benefits again. We have much higher quality vacuum in that environment than anything on Earth, a factor of a thousand minimum better vacuum environment uh, in space. And that gives us higher purity materials. We have increased pumping speed, and again, a semi-infinite, it's very difficult to calculate that in a meaningful manner because people talk about pumps as a, as a pipe or a pump attached. Uh, however, that gives us also higher purity materials. It also allows us to do processing in, in, in orbit. We can dump gases in our environment and they'll be removed by the pumping speed, therefore give us high quality materials in the end. There are no chamber walls to contaminate, so we can have mixes of terms of materials put on there, higher purity materials. We have a lot, very large volume, 100 times more, at least 100 times larger than the, than the uh, uh, vacuum chambers that are currently used to terrestrial to try to make thin film materials. And that means large samples, large production runs, and integrated processing possibilities uh, for those for those types of uh, applications. And what kind of benefits do these, therefore, unique aspects of the vacuum environment give us? 
Well, we can do regrowth and in situ processing. We can make transistors that are that are uh, higher quality than what are done terrestrially. We can do what are called growth instructions and have very precise interfaces between layers that we grow. We can have a, a reduction in noise of a transistor because of the very high purity uh, in the environment. We can also make materials in space for use in space. But we need solar cells for a space station. Instead of carting up the, all of the mass that supports the solar cell, which is 70% of the, of the structure for a solar array, simply make the solar cells on orbit and don't have to worry about that, all that mass structure that you need for, uh, uh, for launch. And you can do process integration, a variety of etching processes that give you a large, uh, 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 larger applications for your materials. And in fact, things like oxides that are required for barrier oxides for transistors are pretty well be done in environments. What are the kind of materials that we're working on right now? High frequency transistors. <coughs> this is a high power, high linearity, high frequency transistors for microcommunications. IR lasers for sensing, monitoring, and defense applications. Ultra low noise transistors for personal communication systems. High frequency solar cells for again for space and remote power applications. High speed trans transistors for computers. All of these materials and applications benefit can benefit from that unique vacuum environment and therefore give us a product that has a higher performance than products made from these <coughs> made uh, in, on, in the Earth environment. <coughs> so I've kind of identified the five flight uh, program and the goals are then to lay the foundation for using this vacuum in space. Prove the concept that we can hire quality materials uh, and uh, advanced digital materials that can be developed in this environment. Demonstrate that we can make industrial quantities for, of, the, of these things, commercial quantities, and really have a business focus in that space environment, and realize a cost-effective platform for doing that, because it's not cost-effective business that we're using. And that then brings us to the next phase of the program, whereby we would look at uh, what are the market, oh, uh, sorry, the next phase of the program would then be the commercial phase of the program, where we've gone through the proof of concept experiment, the fact that it's never been done before, but now in the process of being done. And when you talk about commercial, uh, commercial applications, you need to understand the market a bit more. Now let's look at the market for a second in terms of microelectronics only. Um, <coughs> identify that there are benefits from space production as materials. Enhance their performance. And if we focus on high performance, high end products initially, uh, let's look at the total semiconductor market. 1995, is $118 billion. That is just for the chip market itself. Not the products, chips only. Two billion of that market in 95 was for advanced semiconductors, and this, and 85% of that was for gallium arsenide uh, transistors for, for uh, cell phones. That market wasn't there five years ago. Remember, your cell phone came in a briefcase. Use all silicon technology and old battery technology. Battery technology is improved, and now they've integrated gallium arsenide chips into cell phones <coughs> for higher efficiency and lower poverty. What you require is a production facility to impact this market. And that means you can't use the experimental platform we, we've worked on to date. We need a platform that really does more than that. And that brings us to the, the production facility. It's a five to 10 year orbiting platform, not something that goes up on one shuttle and comes back down again. That's something that's cost effective. Probably an ELD launch. Similar in general design to the wake shield, the size, the 12 foot diameter size of the wake shield is a reasonable size that can be used uh, really for a commercial uh, production facility. It has robotic support and servicing for thin production. You want to harvest the finished product, you want to replenish the raw materials, and you want to use space station as a logistics transport and servicing node. In that concept, there is a use for space station. It's there, it might be there, it will be there. Uh, let's use it if it's there. And in fact, let's use it as a transfer storage uh, and storage node. Store the raw materials, store the products, store some <coughs> components for your free-flying platform, uh, have the robotics interface present there so you can in fact service your platform, and service means harvest as well as repair as needed, and you may want to do some 
characterization pre or post processing on the wave shield, i.e., if you've got a run of 10,000 samples, you want to at least take the first 50 that you'll run, look at them, and make sure that they really are what you want them to be, and then do the rest of the 9,950. In terms of servicing the wave shield, part two, you could do it by simply docking the vehicle with space station. Well, it turns out that's difficult in the current configuration because only Progress and Shuttle can dock with the space station. Uh, and so that requires a fair amount of political uh, uh, machinations to get there. You could put it on a tether, reel it in every uh, three or four months, and uh, do the servicing and reel it back out again. Or you can have a dog run up and down the tether, and the dog be the robotic dog and have it then service the, 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 the vehicle. You can have a service vehicle, a space taxi, and there's been designs for space taxis for the past at least 15 years uh, that would run around on lower orbit. Uh, the sh theoretically, the shuttle could, could do servicing itself, since it does visit the space station, or will visit the space station. Or you could have maybe an, even an ELV do some servicing and have it simply drop down uh, from orbit. Those are all options, and uh, those options are all being looked at currently in terms of how to utilize that environment. The um, simple schematic of that is then if you launch the raw materials, uh, the space station, store them there, uh, service them, the service wake shield with those raw materials uh, as needed, pick up the finished products, bring them back, store them for the next ride down, and uh, bring them back to Earth and have them processed then into final wafers, although there may be some pre processing steps that are already done in the vacuum environment. Remember, in the current semiconductor technology, you've got ultra clean rooms, uh, you've seen the Intel commercials with the uh, dancing robots, uh, or dumb bots as we call them. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, you need to stay ultra clean because you want to maximize the yield, minimize the contamination of your, of your materials. And in fact, what better place to minimize contamination than the ultra vacuum space? <clears throat> so do some pre-processing in space, and maybe someday you can make the whole chip in space. What's the economic viability? Well, as I said, in terms of Wakefield Mark II, modeled after the same size of Wakefield they currently have, we could run about 7,000 samples per year. That comes out to be between 20 and 40 million devices. Uh, the devices, depending on what they are, could have a, a, a variety of values. The lowest kind of value devices of a, a high-speed FET run of the order of a couple bucks a piece. Um, the, uh, the highest value devices in terms of things like, like uh, solid-state lasers can run up to 10 and $50 a piece. You only need 300 kilograms of raw material to generate this number of devices. 300 kilograms in terms of mass to orbit is nothing. And in fact, you'd like to do that probably quarterly. Sorry, so this is a yearly amount, so you want to resupply, say, quarterly or so. Bring up, uh, I can't divide anymore, I suppose I can. Bring up about uh, 80 or 90, uh, uh, well, one of those. Uh, uh, kilograms of, uh, of material every, um, every uh, I guess, three months to make it quarterly. Uh, and the product value, current product value, for material that's made terrestrially in, the, in our vacuum chambers, say for high-speed transistors, runs between $60,000 and $200,000 per kilogram, depending on the product. So the value of the material is very high. The raw product cost is about uh, $2,000 per kilogram. And so there's a significant value added from the processing. And whether you do the processing on the Earth or the processing in space, the value added is from that. And the higher performance expectations from the space materials uh, could even lead to higher value of that product. And that itself already is significantly high compared to even current launch costs for mass. Talking about a factor of 10 increase in, in cost at, at current times, sometimes a factor of 8 increase for the chip itself and the module itself. Yes? Um, what, are we talking, what are we talking about in terms of current costs for wafers, you said the RSI wafers, and how the impression I've gotten from reading, some, from reading some inductor literature is that manufacturers tend to like cheap wafers over expensive wafers, and they go to expensive wafers with great gnashing of teeth and unhappiness. Sure, and the answer is the cheap wafers are good for the kind of things that are cheap today. Your cell phone is free when you when you when you order cell service now. Those those transistors they use in those cell phones are low quality. They have a power uh, and a, and a performance increase over silicon by factors of two or three, not factors of eight or ten that they theoretically should have. But those are the kind of things that the mass market could address immediately. 
the high-end side of performance, the cell phone base station is an example, which services 100,000 units, uh, is the one where the high-performance uh, uh, materials are, in fact, is demanded more than that, where, and where the higher prices are, are, are used. Let me finish up my three slides. Okay. We did, in fact, an economic model, in fact, a year and a half, two ago with our business school. An economic model was the following, that we would do to build a facility that cost about $30 million. That's about twice what it cost us to build the original Lake Shield. It would be a bit more sophisticated, but uh, that seems, uh, from our experience, a very doable, from your experience, probably very cheap. Nonetheless, from our experience, a very doable facility. We're assuming launch costs of 10,000 per kilogram, let's say in the year 2004 or so. Uh, uh, 10,000 per kilogram, that's probably even high, I would hope, by that point in time. Whereas we include resupply, servicing operations, and marketing in the cost structure. And then we have about a 35 million uh, annual uh, product value per weight shield uh, uh, unit with a 10-year operation. Give us an internal rate of return of 30 plus or minus 50%. That's not a bad number. What does it say? It doesn't say that we're good economic forecasters. It says that we're not off by a factor of 10 on either side. It says that there's something economically viable in this concept. Can you increase IRR? Sure you can. You can add secondary payloads to the dirty side of, the, of your Mark II wake shield. You can add material purification. You can add some earth sensing and some remote um, uh, communications uh, payloads on that side and further increase because you've got a platform that's flying there. You know, you're using really half of the platform. Let me conclude then. In terms of the Mark II, and the expectations, we believe we have an economically viable manufacturing facility in space. We can make high performance electronic materials, high yield products, uh, large, very large areas can be made there which can't be done in the terrestrial. And we can also do unique processing of products in space that can't be done here. This regrowth concept that I told you about, the growth and properties and things for high performance materials. It's also very versatile, could be a versatile space platform, so you can do other things on there for secondary payloads and therefore the same your return on the investment. We believe that we will clearly with the WSF program and this utilization of the ultra vacuum environments made for thin films advance the economic development of space and expect to make some money for some of them. Thank you. They're not hermetically sealed, but they're protected from that, so we should have no problem. That's one thing there. Why not use MIR? Why not use MIR? Because MIR has an annular ring of crud following it around in orbit. It really does. And that crud is, is with a capital K. Yes? How high how high an altitude would you have to go to get the same vacuum without a weight shield? Yeah, that's about between 30 and 50,000 kilometers. It is hard to get things up there real, real cost effectively now. Someday it may be. Yes? Uh, how much more efficient would solar cells uh, produced uh, by this process be than the currently uh, current terrestrially pr produced ones? Okay. We, in fact, one of our projects in the center is to, to do high efficiency solar cells. We have solar cells now that are doing about 32% efficiency uh, with this process. Uh, in fact, the, the, all of the high efficiency solar cells that are, on the, that are out there currently are done by this epitaxial thin film process. Right? And the question in terms of efficiency is the recombination of electron mobile pairs and solar cells. As a result, if you minimize the defects, you minimize the combination, you enhance efficiency. Now, we haven't grown any on orbit. That's our intent and expectation to see what the delta of efficiency increase is on orbit with respect to with respect on the ground. We expect to see another probably five percent increase. So go from thirty to thirty-five to thirty-seven percent. Last one. Um, on the larger items you're talking about, you can make. How would you store the? I mean, if you did the size of the disk or a little bit smaller, where would you store that at when you're doing it? Because you're going to have to. If you're right. doing multiple 
Correct. And the answer is the robotics interface to move that in place in terms of the growth and remove it out of the way and put it in storage. Realize you're in micro AG, so it's not a difficult to, thing to do. And our focus initially has been to you to do this large area development for things that will be used in space. As an example, the space power satellite concept has been around for a number of years. It needs square kilometers of solar cells on orbit to do it to, to do any good. We can make those square kilometers in a relatively short period of time, a couple of years, on orbit with a facility something like this, and use those large areas directly there instead of working on storage. So will it get dirty once you move it? No, no, because remember, you're still in the vacuum of space. Once you make the film and once you make the device, then it's essentially impervious to your environment. So it's not a problem. Dust in space? I know, you don't have to. Oh, there's no dust in space. That's right. Thank you.